Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us for our 14th uh, virtual history. This is Nathan Dennys with the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we host these programs uh, with Baltimore Heritage. And uh, for everyone who donated, thank you. Your donations are split between Baltimore Heritage and the Architecture Foundation. I, I cannot believe that we have been doing this now for 14 weeks. It's been wonderful to have your continued support. And those of you who have been with us since the beginning might remember Jackson Gilman Ferlini, our speaker today, presented our very first virtual history back in May. And we are delighted to have him return. And before we get started, I'd like to share our upcoming virtual histories. We are days away from the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. On Friday, August 21st, uh, Megan Bacco of Preservation Maryland will present about the people and places of Maryland's long and diverse women's suffrage and voting rights movement. And on August 28th, architect Jillian Storms will join us to share the stories of the first women in Maryland to become registered architects. And you can register for these programs um, on our website, baltimorearchitecture.org. And now today's presentation. Jackson Gilman Ferlini is the Historic Preservation Officer for the Baltimore City Department of General Services, where he manages the preservation of city-owned historic landmarks. He holds a BA and MA in Historic Preservation from Goucher College, where his thesis dealt with the adaptive reuse of monuments and memorials. He is frequently quoted in the Baltimore Sun and has written for Maryland Historical Magazine and the architecture blog, uh, McMansion Hell. And as part of uh, Jackson's job, he gets to do these interesting research projects into city-owned buildings, which is how he, uh, he gained everything he knows to give us this wonderful presentation today. And if you have questions, you can add them into the Zoom chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. With that, take it away, Jackson. Thanks so much, Nathan. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the, having the BAF have me back in Baltimore Heritage, and I'm really excited uh, to be with you today to share some of this research. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Great. Can you see everything okay? Looks great. Okay. Well, again, uh, my name is Jackson Gilman Forlini. I work for the city. Um, and uh, I want to talk to you today about some research I've been working on for the last couple of years uh, about Baltimore's first recreation center, the Roosevelt Recreation Center in Hamden, and about how suffragists got it built. Uh, this is what it looks like today. And my first introduction to this building was um, in my capacity as a city employee. A coworker of mine, Frank Lee, was overseeing a uh, energy retrofit of the building, and he uh, talked to me about it and I looked at it and the architecture really intrigued me. So I dug into the history a little bit more. And, um, and I discovered uh, that the, uh, the building had this really intriguing history. Uh, today, rec centers are a big part of community life uh, in many major cities, including Baltimore. Uh, and they're in the news a lot as well. Baltimore City Department of Recs and Parks maintains over 40 rec centers. Uh, at the same time, we're also now talking a lot about women's suffrage. Uh, and as uh, Nathan mentioned, this is the centennial year. We're four days away from the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Uh, and so the question that I aim to address today is how the rec center system in Baltimore originally was conceived. And this brings us to the confluence of two seemingly different movements, one uh, focused on recreation and the other on women's suffrage. Um, and I hope to prove that the current system of recreation that we have today, center and uh, rec centers, is a legacy of the women's suffrage movement and Maryland suffragists in particular. Uh, so let's go to the uh, hero of our story. This is Edith Houghton Hooker. Um, Edith Houghton Hooker um, really led the charge for the creation of rec centers uh, in Baltimore and in Maryland. She was a progressive era reformer um, and also highly educated for the time. Um, she attended Bryn Mawr College, and this is a photo of her at Bryn Mawr looking uh, quite sharp in her jacket and tie. And uh, she also was one of the first women to attend the Johns Hopkins University Medical School. She was most concerned with improving uh, women's health and reproductive rights. Um, and she also, later with her husband, Donald Hooker, uh, led the, a, a major role in founding Baltimore's chapter of Planned Parenthood. Uh, but in this period, in the early 20th century, she was most known as a 
suffragist leader. Uh, she formed the Just Government League in 1909, which was a suffrage organization. Uh, she founded and published the Suffrage News in 1912, uh, which was a local paper. And then uh, in 1917, she became the editor of Alice Paul's The Suffragist, the newspaper of the National Women's Party. So she was an instrumental, um, played an instrumental role in uh, Baltimore uh, fight for women's suffrage. Uh, she was also uh, the sister of this woman, uh, Catherine Houghton Hepburn. And Catherine Houghton Hepburn's daughter was, of course, the icon Catherine Hepburn. Uh, and so now that the, uh, apparently they enjoyed a very close relationship. Catherine Hepburn would come to visit Baltimore uh, quite frequently to visit her aunt. So now that we've uh, passed the clickbait portion of the presentation, we'll move on to the serious history. Okay, so um, Edith Houghton Hooker was uh, influenced by urban progressivism uh, and particularly the playground movement. This was a movement that started in Germany in the 1890s. And it was a movement that focused on creating safe play spaces for children as a means of counteracting the societal ills of industrialization. Cities were a rough and tumble place back then and kids would be playing in the streets uh, and it really wasn't a safe environment. So the playground movement sought to create playgrounds. Um, in Baltimore in 1897, this got started with the Children's Playground Association. Uh, and this was a movement largely organized by women uh, because the traditional role of women at the time was child rearing. Uh, so children's safety and also child labor laws were something that came out of this more broadly. But also, recreation had its roots in public hygiene. Uh, this was a time when not everybody uh, had access to a bath. And so um, public hygiene was an important element to the rec center initially. Uh, and it was also a moralistic kind of movement. It was about uplifting morally the urban poor. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, it also had its roots in settlement houses, particularly Jane Addams Hull House in Chicago. And here's an image of the kindergarten at Hull House. Uh, and this was a tool for assimilating immigrants, which later on became uh, a part of the role that rec centers would play. Uh, in 1907, there was a major watershed mo mo moment in the recreation center movement. And this was the so-called Play Congress in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, this was the first national convention of the newly formed Playground Association of America. And there was a Baltimore delegation present at this conference, um, in part at the urging of then President Theodore Roosevelt, who sat on the board of the Playground Association of America and encouraged all municipalities in the United States to send representatives to learn from Chicago, which really led the way in building recreation centers. To reformers, though, um, really, this, it served multiple roles than just recreation. Recreation was about marrying physical health with moral health in order to produce good citizens. It had a broad mission to, associated with it. So beginnings in Baltimore. The, um, the beginnings here started in 1908, just following that convention, when Edith Houghton Hooker becomes the president of the Children's Playground Association in Baltimore. And she teams up with a very wealthy and powerful man, Robert Garrett, who is the, uh, was a son of the famous Garrett family, and actually a nephew of Mary Elizabeth Garrett, one of the leading suffragists in Maryland. Uh, he was an athlete who competed competed in the very first modern Olympics in 1896 and was actually a gold medal champion in discus. And he founded a complement to the uh, Children's Playground Association, which was the Public Athletic League. And this was mostly function or focused on uh, boys' health uh, as opposed to very young children or girls. In 1908, the two of them get together and they form this organization, the Hamden Woodbury Neighborhood Association. And this is the organization that really takes the lead in getting the Roosevelt Rec Center built. Uh, at first, they occupy a rented space, but didn't have any heat. And they realized pretty quickly that they needed a purpose-built rec center specific to their uses. Uh, and they needed to raise the money. Uh, they needed about $25,000 to get the first one built. And they got our first win by getting a check for $3,000 from the Bath Commission. Now, well, that's kind of weird. Why the Bath Commission? Well, this time, Baltimore and actually most major cities in the US, uh, a lot of working class uh, housing just didn't have bathroom facilities in it. And so um, there were a lot of people who just were unable to take a bath. There was a philanthropic movement at the same time to create public baths. And here we have an image 
uh, in the uh, late 19th century of young boys waiting to uh, take a bath at a, more of a ramshackle attempt at a public bath. Uh, they're probably waiting for the first bath ever here. Uh, and so the Bath Commission was a tangential movement to recreation. So they need the rest of the money. They go to the mayor and city council for $10,000 uh, and the city council kind of takes their time deliberating. But the bath is interesting because it draws a literal and figurative connection between both bodily cleanliness and moral cleanliness. This is in the eyes of the reformers at the time. So um, they need a location for their rec center and they decide that they're gonna have it uh, in what was then called West Park. West Park is what we now call today Roosevelt Park. And it's on the very far western edge of Hamden. And uh, you can see here on the map, uh, along on the right here, Falls Road. And we have on the north, 36th Street. At the time, there was a reservoir in West Park, the Hamden Reservoir, which was later filled in. Uh, and here we have an image of what the reservoir looked like. And way up the top here, along 36th Street, where it is today, is the site of the Roosevelt Rec Center, what was then West Park Rec Center. Um, the property was owned by the city, and so that helped them somewhat in trying to get the land, but they still needed additional resources. So why Hamden? Why did they, these reformers decide that the first rec center was gonna be in Hamden? Well, in Baltimore, because there wasn't really a concerted public policy effort from the city to construct rec centers, the initiative largely fell to private reformers. And so where did those private reformers live? Most of them lived in Roland Park, which was then the most fashionable neighborhood. These were largely upper middle class and fairly wealthy people. And because they lived so close to Hamden, they would travel through it regularly and they would see the uh, kind of urban blight, not blight, but excuse me, the, the ills of urban life um, and of industrialization and that they wanted to step in and to assist these people. And that leads into this legacy of paternalism. Going back to the 19th century, early 19th century even, Hamden, and, and Nathan has done a lot of research on this, uh, um, Hamden had a legacy of being a mill town where essentially the mill owners owned the housing, they built the schools, they built the libraries, they had the company store. And so the people of Hamden were very receptive uh, to this way of outsiders stepping in to provide um, assistance to them. And so it had this legacy of paternalism. Also, Hamden was the political stronghold of the Republican Party at this time. Uh, during the Progressive Era, the Republican Party was largely the party most closely associated with the progressives. Um, that line was blurred in some instances, but, but by and large, um, the, the Republicans were more in support of these types of reforms. So why suffragists? Well, for um, suffragists, recreation facilities provided the kind of evidence um, that women needed to demonstrate the physical evidence that they needed to demonstrate why they needed to vote. It was a public infrastructure that overlapped with what was in the traditional role of women in society, which was child rearing and raising their children to be good citizens. So the argument went, well, we need, uh, we've been tasked by society with raising our kids to be good citizens, but when they go out in the streets, when they come home from school, they have no place to play. And so we need enfranchisement to support policies that will build safe infrastructure for those children. So it wasn't to them a natural fit. Uh, and here's a quote from the Sun, uh, sort of demonstrating how Hamden embraced this idea. Mrs. Hooker, our hero, right at the start, won Hamden with honeyed words. If that enterprising little hamlet does not head the list of women's suffrage villages, it will be from lack of appreciation. So they needed a design. And here we have the conceptual design for the Roosevelt Park Rec Center. It was designed by J.B. Noel Wyatt, then one of the most prominent uh, Baltimore architects. He was educated at MIT, Harvard, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And at this point, it was actually kind of at the tail end of his career. Uh, he designed the current Baltimore City Courthouse, now Mitchell Courthouse. If any of you have been there, uh, you'll have seen his work. And uh, this was his conceptual design, largely unchanged um, to the final product here. Uh, basically, just the windows on the end here uh, are doors on his design. And um, what's interesting about this building is that it's unusually modern 
for its time. There really wasn't anything else built in Baltimore like it at this time. Uh, there was some, um, it was constructed of concrete. So its design and method of construction were unusual. It was poured concrete, cast in place concrete. There had only been a, a handful of other buildings in Baltimore constructed this way. So where did he get this idea from? Um, where did he get these, these things like this Dutch gable over the roof, uh, the poured concrete, uh, the sense of horizontality of large eaves with exposed rafters? Well, uh, he threw also threw in, like we said, the baths, uh, an auditorium, a gymnasium, club rooms, a library, and offices. So what was the precedent here? Well, Wyatt, um, he basically emulated what was then the only style available or, or known to be available for rec centers, and that was a, a sort of idiosyncratic style developed by Daniel Hudson Burnham, the, the father, what is, he's known as the father of American urban planning. And in 1905, Burnham developed this set of buildings for Chicago's park system. And it was here in 1907 that attendees of the Play Congress saw these buildings, particularly the one in Sherman Park, and brought these ideas back to Baltimore, which uh, Wyatt emulated. Uh, and so we see the same elements. You have the Dutch gable roof at the top, the wide flared eaves here, uh, you have the two story, and then of course it's poured concrete construction. Also a central block flanked by two outer wings, like in the Hamilton Park field house. Burnham called these field houses, but they were really functionally rec centers or proto rec centers. Uh, and so we see those same elements here, right? You can see the similarities. Uh, so what's um, particularly important about this uh, is that also Wyatt didn't just copy it wholesale. He adapted the style somewhat and he stripped away some of Burnham's more classical Beaux-Arts ornaments. And he borrowed heavily from the prairie style. And so we have here an example of prairie style architecture with poured concrete by George Mayer, 1908, uh, in Kenilworth, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. And here we have very recognizably this buttress on the corner of the building, which is copied as well in the Roosevelt Park building. Um, the, the window pattern and then the um, archway over the door. And so what Wyatt is doing here is that he's pointing us in the direction of what the building is to be used for. He's giving us a clue that this is a building which is supposed to be for recreation. And um, it's a logical folding in of form and function, which was very emblematic of the transition to modern design nascent in the period. Indeed, the transition to modernity was really what the rec center was all about from uh, expanding public health to urbanization to, of course, expanding democratic representation for women. But it wasn't easy. They had their design and um, they needed some funds now to build it. Initially, they went to the city and they actually appealed to the mayor uh, to create a city policy to construct these buildings. There is in 1909 a city charter revision commission, which recommends a, the creation of a public recreation commission, separate from the parks department. Remember, parks came earlier. Recreation developed separately. Uh, but of course, the amendment fails in the Maryland state legislature. Probably, we're not sure why, but probably because uh, there were some civil service reforms attached to the bill that politicians uh, didn't really like too much. I don't know why, but there you go. Uh, in 1910, the city council continues to delay an appropriation. And by this point, Edith Houghton Hooker is getting very frustrated. Uh, and with some frustration, and I think even maybe I detect a little sarcasm in her voice, she writes this. The building we wish to construct in Hamden ought really to be a municipal building. Baltimore, however, has not yet become aware of the fact that one of the duties of the city is to provide proper recreational facilities for the leisure time of its citizens. Consequently, it is necessary for some enterprising district, i.e. Hamden, to indicate to the city what its duty in this regard is. Well, uh, She's sitting there saying, if they're not going to pay us to, or they're not going to take the initiative to do this, then we're just going to have to roll up our sleeves and do it ourselves as a pilot. And this was the right strategy. It 
basically worked. They received the $10,000 they needed from the city in May 1910. They get the thing built and uh, they cut the ribbon on June 13th, 1911 to great fanfare. This is a photograph of the opening day. This was um, a huge event, 15,000 people turned out. There was a parade, music, uh, food. The people of Hamden loved their rec center and it was a huge success with them. So what was it like in those early days? Well, uh, in the first couple of years, they had about 98,000 visitors who came through, exclusive of the 43,000 to the public baths. Uh, this was a building as much for adults, we have to remember, as it was for children, with a particular emphasis on building a strong, cohesive nuclear family unit, which was an important reason for them at the time. And also, we have to remember, too, that it was segregated, just like all parks facilities, and indeed most public buildings in Baltimore at this time were officially segregated. The types of activities that went on, it really ran the gamut. Games, carnivals, charity drives, athletic events, of course, but also early film screenings, musical performances, theater, dance, etc. And almost immediately, the very enterprising people and very politically conscious people of Hamden began to politically organize out of the building. And they had things like socialist and suffrage meetings, which, of course, Edith Houghton Hooker was delighted with. But not everyone was. This is the center's first director, Anne Delia Melvin. She was from Baltimore, and she graduated from my alma mater, Goucher College, in 1910 and immediately became the first director of then the West Park Rec Center. And she was a strong supporter of women's suffrage. Uh, she was a secretary of the Baltimore Equal Suffrage League. And in 1912, while still director of the center, she participated in a suffrage parade organized by Hooker in which she was dressed as Joan of Arc and paraded down the streets of Baltimore uh, on a white horse to champion women's suffrage. So she was down with the cause, but she clashed over Hooker for an interesting reason. She felt that the role of the rec center ought to be an apolitical one, and that political activism was not something that should be encouraged, at least within its bounds. She criticized the use of the rec center to promote these things like socialism, and strangely enough, women's suffrage. But she, it also wasn't all that clear cut. Um, because she did advance a political message in a different way. She believed that rec centers could dismantle broader social divisions in society. And here's a quote from her from 1913, while center director, the perfect recreation center with opportunities of free entry by those of varying classes, races, and faith offers untold possibilities in the development of the common understanding, as Woodrow Wilson expresses it. An equal division of gymnasium and entertainment privileges, regardless of financial position or caste, develops a sense of social justice quite wholesome for young and old. The people learn that their differences are not vital and their similarities give them much in common. Now, this is a quite a radical statement, uh, particularly at Baltimore, which at this time was deeply segregated. Only three years prior to this, the city council had passed the first ordinance in the nation that legally mandated housing segregation along race, racial lines. And so the fact that she is now publicly coming out and stating this, saying that not only should rec centers be desegregated, but that they can be used as a tool to eliminate segregation throughout society, really is quite a remarkable vision for her time and place. Uh, likewise, there were other lessons learned. Uh, Hooker, a few years after the beginning of this experiment, um, states that the experience of West Park suggests a new recreation policy. Remember, the city still hadn't started one. And according to this plan, the city should be granted a certain annual appropriation to be expended for the construction and equipment of recreation centers. Um, of course, both of these women were well ahead of their time in their vision for how this, how society should function and these places should function. And of course we know, unfortunately, it would be many decades before their vision would become a reality because despite the success, the city still takes 
no real initiative in terms of creating a public recreation policy. It's all piecemeal. Uh, but still, the Children's Playground Association and the Public Athletic League plot along, and they are successful in privately building rec facilities, which, and you can see here a map from 1938, uh, quite uh, with a dot for each recreation facility, quite an accomplishment considering that they had started from scratch three decades prior and had little to no city help. Uh, they joined forces in 1922, and the two organizations merged to form the Playground Athletic League. And finally, now almost 30 years after Hooker suggests it, the city assumes rec responsibility for rec centers in 1937. And in 1946, the current Department of Rec and Parks, as we now know it, is created. And then finally, 1955, more than 40 years after Melvin suggests this, uh, park facilities are finally desegregated following Brown v. Board of Ed. And what's interesting too here is that this timeline closely mimics somewhat the suffrage movement. Uh, in Maryland, at least, the 19th Amendment was not ratified by the state until 1941. And the rat that ratification vote was not certified until 1958, three years after uh, public facilities were desegregated. At, uh, rec center facilities were desegregated. And of course, as we know, enforcing the right to vote was not universally guaranteed by the federal government until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, so we were slow to get there, um, but the legacy lives on. And uh, Hooker's obituary in 1948 listed the Roosevelt Rec Center as among her life's great accomplishments. We don't remember her for that today, um, but it was important to her. And it has remained also an important anchor institution in Hamden for over 100 years. Uh, Baltimore City Rec and Parks maintains the property, they've invested in it, um, and they continue to program it. And those investments actually have been very respectful of the historic fabric. Uh, the original steel windows are still intact. The floor plan is basically identical to as it was in 1911. Uh, and the historic integrity and significance remains quite high, in, in my opinion, making it a good candidate potentially for future recognition and, and preservation. But we need to recognize, too, that our recreation facilities, although they seem maybe worlds away from the women's suffrage movement, now that we are in a time uh, thinking about this movement more in the centennial year, I think we should recognize that uh, these rec centers are an enduring legacy of Maryland suffragists at the beginning of the 20th century, and that their vision is still a very viable one for today and for the future. So uh, with that, I will conclude my talk and uh, I open up for questions. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Jackson. This was, this was fantastic and, and so informative too. I'm going to take a look at some of the questions um, we have here. I mean, just give me a second to- Sure, of course. Um, look through them, and I seem to have lost my question. Oh, there's the question box, okay. Um, are the current PAL centers related to the Public Athletic League? You know, that's a good question. I, um, I would assume so, but I am not uh, up on, as well as I should, uh, other existing recreation facilities. Um, this research, I should couch this by saying this research is still ongoing um, and I'm only gotten up to the early first quarter of the 20th century. So stay tuned, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Great, and next question. Uh, because there were so few women in Baltimore who were recognized as architects, do you see other examples of women activism manifest in the structural outlays of Baltimore City? Baltimore is noted for its clusters of neighborhoods that often resemble self-contained villages of sorts. I'm sorry, could you repeat the, sec the, the second part of that question? Yeah, it, it said that Baltimore is, is notable for its clusters of, of close-knit neighborhoods that often resemble villages. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I agree with that. There are a lot of other historical reasons for that pattern of urban development. And actually, Nathan, your research has shown uh, how the Woodbury neighborhood also uh, sort of sprung up in that exact way. Um, it, I don't think that it's necessarily directly tied to this particular movement. I haven't found evidence of that, but I will keep an eye out for it. 
Great. And yeah, the the um the other part of, of the question too is sort of asking like how how else have, have women and suffragists influenced um the, the built environment in, in Baltimore? Okay, yeah. So um, it wasn't just rec centers that they advocated for. Uh, it was a variety of different things. Paved streets, um, uh, having uh, better access to water, uh, the bath facilities as well. Uh, women and particularly suffragists were able to advance their cause by explaining why the built environment was insufficient and that we needed to have reforms and that we needed to build safe places and that they should have a role in that. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it wasn't just rec centers. It was all different things that we just look past today and, and take for granted. Great. And you mentioned the, the segregated facilities. Did the segregation also extend to Jewish people? Um, so that's a good question. I, I, I don't know... In, a, in an official sense, if um, the, the Roosevelt Rec Center was officially segregated in terms of excluding people, uh, Jewish people, and, and also on basis of faith. Uh, what I do know, though, is that they probably wouldn't have felt very welcome if they had gone to the Rec Center, because Hamden, at this time, was an extremely insulated population and a very uh, homogenous population demographically. Uh, and in, did, they did not really welcome outsiders. I, I did find some evidence of private uh, club meetings being held in the rec center, which were run by historically nativist organizations. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I'm, I don't think it would have been a nice place or they would have felt very welcome. That said, Melvin uh, was inspired by to to write those remarks that I read to you by a conversation that she had instructing a young Jewish boy uh, who showed a very high level of of um, emotional intelligence and and tolerance that that really struck her and I so it's possible maybe she was instructing him at the rec center but it, it could have been elsewhere yeah and there's there's also evidence of of um, racism against the Jewish merchants on the, on the avenue from this yeah. period too. Um, another question uh, related to segregation: Did did blacks have have black only recreation centers, um, and what what facilities were were, were created for uh, black people in the city? Yes, there there were. It, it was segregated, and there were separate um, recreation facilities. Um, but of course, as we know, they were not equal whatsoever. Uh, there were fewer of them. They were less well maintained. Uh, they were just not as nice. Um, one of the most famous is uh, swimming pool number two in Druid Hill Park, uh, which uh, was a um, the main swimming pool for African Americans in Baltimore at this time because they were excluded from others. And uh, it was, but you know, of course, the, these facilities that were constructed were were not on par. Uh, but they did exist, and and um, many of them were constructed by the uh, Public Athletic League and the Children's Playground Association. Great. And we have a question about the relationship of, of uh, Robert Garrett to the movement. He was, um, he was apparently an outspoken segregationist. Yes. How, did, how, how did that, how did he get along with suffragists who were advocating? Um, against how, how did he get along with them? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, so this is an excellent point. Um, Robert Garrett, uh, despite some progressive mo ideas, uh, he was a staunch segregationist and eventually was pushed out as chair of the uh, Parks and Recreation Board Commission in the 1950s when he took a hardline stance against integration. So um, he is, uh, uh, his, his reputation is, is tarnished by this. Uh, I am not sure the specific way in which he got along with Hooker and other members of the board of the um, uh, rec center board. Uh, and I don't know his exact position on suffrage. Uh, in some ways he was very conservative and in other ways he was very progressive. So he was a complicated figure. Great. And uh, did communities request future rec centers to be built or did the playground association uh, choose those sites um, based on where they could find money and funding? It was a little bit of both. Um, the I think for, for the Roosevelt Park, that was a, a pilot specifically chosen, I think, because it was its proximity to Roland Park. And also there was a, a grassroots will 
uh, to support it there. Other neighborhoods, um, there were more kind of neighborhood grassroots type organization that advocated for rec centers. Uh, and so it was working in, in tandem. I do know for a fact also that Hooker was a big supporter of having the neighborhood guide this, just these decisions. She felt, she believed in what she called home rule. That is to say that the people who live in that neighborhood should really call the shots about how the and where these are built and how they're operated. Great, and um, last question I have here, um, or oh, actually you know, a couple more questions. Are there any uh, construction drawings available for the building? Have you found any any architectural plans for it? Not yet, I had the, that conceptual drawing I showed earlier, that was from a Baltimore Sun clipping, which luckily survived. The other original drawings, I'm not sure where they are. If somebody knows, please let me know. Uh, we do have at my job in our archive of drawings, we have drawings of the building from a series of renovations that occurred in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so we do have some as-built drawings from that time period, but, but not original to the building's construction, no. Uh, was there a cost for taking a bath at the at the bathhouses um, that that were set up, and was was a soap was soap and towel provided? Yeah, uh, the answer to the question is yes for both. Uh, there were towels. You were there were uh, big angry signs posted that said you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law if you steal a towel. Uh, so they, I guess that would must have been a problem. People taking the towels home with them. There was an admission fee. I don't recall offhand what the fee was at West Park, at Roosevelt Park, but I did the, the photograph that was in the PowerPoint earlier about the earlier bathhouse, the more ramshackle one. There's a sign posted on it that says uh, men three cents admission. So uh, that was, um, there was, there was a fee to recoup some of the cost. And uh, last question I have for you is, uh, do you know when the park changed from being called West Park to Roosevelt Park? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, thank you for that question. It was rededicated in 1920, just following Theodore Roosevelt's death the year before. And this wasn't a coincidence that they selected this park. Um, Roosevelt was a big supporter of recreation, of athleticism, as we all know. He was also most closely associated with the progressive movement. And he was president while this building was being conceived. And he was the one who encouraged Baltimore to send a delegation to Chicago to learn from what they had learned in terms of recreation. And so Roosevelt, had a, he's sort of the shadow figure in this story. And uh, it wasn't a coincidence that they dedicated it in his honor. Great. Well, thank you, Jackson. This was a very informative presentation, and I hope everyone can join us again next week as we have a, a we'll be going deeper into Maryland's uh, suffrage movement, uh, and it should be a really informative follow-up to this presentation. So thanks again. Thank you, everyone.